Hello and welcome to Good People, Good Things, a podcast all about putting the spotlight on the special people who do good, fun and creative things with a desire to make a positive impact on the well-being of individuals and communities at large. This series is brought to you with a mixture of French and, I'm told, South African accent. I am Flo, your host and your yoga teacher by trade. Let me introduce you to Bale Massey. Bale was born and grew up in Snowdonia, North Wales. Living in such a glorious setting from babyhood, she developed a deep appreciation for her natural habitat. Her two slavey grandmothers also played a huge part in shaping the person she was to become. They taught her how to sew, knit, mend and reuse, which would later send her on the way for her textile journey. In the 1990s, Bali came to study textiles at Goldsmith College. She described living in London as an eye-opening experience for its creativity and multicultural backdrop. After she graduated, Bale lent her skill to the film and TV industries, working on anything from peer drama to big Hollywood productions. In June 2000, parallel to her work in those industries, Bale got to realize her vision. She opened the doors of fabrications on broader markets, a shop dedicated to sustainable textiles, craft and community. Parallel to running projects such as Remember Me, All will be revealed if you keep on listening. Bale regularly holds workshops on mending, embroidery, sewing, knitting, upcycling, featuring guest teachers for specific techniques. Fabrications basically has something for anyone into craft, from beginners to more experienced. Bale, welcome to Good People, Good Things, and thank you so, so much for being my guest today. Well, thank you for inviting me and having me today. So the first question is, You grew up in Snowdonia, which sounds to me anyway pretty idyllic. I've got, I've never been, but I have this image that is just pristine and beautiful and wild. Maybe I'm totally wrong. You'll tell, me, you'll tell me about this. But can you tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up so close to nature? And did you have a lot of freedom as a result? Yes, I was brought up in a very rural area. Um, on the side of a mountain, you know, and I did have neighbors, but it, you know, you kind of knew everyone in your little area, um, you know, that person up the hill or down the lane, um, if you can sort of visualize that, but it was kind of like a string of houses along a road on the side of a mountain. Um, but the nearest village was, you know, a few miles away. So we didn't really have any amenities. Um, so, we grew up in a very uh, low impact way, you know, so we would grow our own vegetables. We had chickens, we had goats at one point. Um, my mum, you know, her joy in life, her name is Joy, uh, is horses. So we even had some, you know, we rented a field for her horses at one point. Um, so we lived quite a simple life really. And, um, My dad had, you know, bought this house. It was quite ramshackle. So he had kind of done it up uh, slowly for us to live in. Um, but yeah, we, you know, I was fortunate to because we had all the space around us. So it was very idyllic. Um, and the area where I was brought up, it's not too far from Carnarvon. So we have the mountains, but also the sea. Um, so we kind of have the best and also lots of forests and so quite diverse landscapes and quite dramatic as well. Um, so there was, you know, a lot of freedom, as you say. Um, we were allowed as children to just wander up the mountain or walk down the lane, uh, meet up with other friends locally, um, walk about. Um, we had dogs as well that we could walk up and around. Um But, you know, also, you know, our family life. So with that freedom also comes, you know, rights and responsibilities, obviously. So so I think, you know, if I maybe compare myself for my upbringing to maybe children in the urban environment now that I live in London, it, you know, and I think particularly at this time, you know, I'm sort of a child of the 70s. So obviously parenting has evolved a lot since then. We're perhaps more aware or, you know, of certain dangers so people's you know parenting has changed I guess to reflect that so um, you know I observe children are not going out as much in a way like I was out you know playing out um, and with the lockdown you know it was surprising even when I went to visit my my dad in Wales he lives, still lives there um, children weren't out and about they were in the house you know whereas 
where they had the opportunity to, you know, so that seemed, that was an observation for me in a change. So even in a rural setting. But for you as a child of the 70s, it must have been so much fun, no? I was very fortunate, yeah, I, you know, to have that opportunity. But um, now I'm a city mouse, so <laughs> I love being in the city. So I was a countryside mouse and now I've moved to the city. <laughs> you're a city mouse, but you know, like the value, because you build up your, your belief and, and system and your values around that time. And I find like if you, you know, you have roots, you know, you have, you're very grounded because of, you're very aware of the impact uh, of things and because of the way you grew up. And I think it's very easy to be very disconnected when you've always grown up in a city you know you just I mean my kids ask me where where does the water in the tap come from or stuff like that but it's very easy to just think it's there and you don't think about it so um yeah it's really really pretty yeah pretty amazing you had that um to give you foundations basically yeah because then when I went into you know setting up my own business sort of you know 25 years ago now that was the approach I wanted to take you know to be as eco as conscious as you know careful and sensitive as I could be um and that seemed to be unusual at that time but to me it felt like well this is perfectly normal um um considerations you know when you're setting up a business um but slowly slowly you know movement is now happening and coming back to how you were I guess introduced to what you're doing now Um, I've read that your grandmothers introduced you to and taught you about uh, textile from a young age. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, they, you know, um, they were people of their time. You know, most people, you know, they've been to, through two world wars, working class background. You know, it was necessity also, you know, to be careful with what you had and to reuse make the most of things um but there was also no sort of, it didn't seem to me anyway growing up there was a shame at all attached to this there was almost like a sense of pride you know to kind of make the most of things and be careful with things you know like my dad's mother she made all her own clothes around the house it was all handmade items you know this the furniture she had invested you know with her and her husband and they had the same furniture lifelong But then she made things to improve them and keep preserve them. She would make all her own preserves and garden, um, you know, and would live a, quite a sort of simple, careful life, but so rich as well because she was creating everything, you know, and then sharing that, you know, so she would let me look through her tins of, you know, she would collect things and save things that would then get reused into other projects, you know, so very thrifty attitude towards um, living, um, but also very creative, you know, to, to take creating things and then also passing on, taking the time, you know, to pass on those skills and inspire me. I feel, you know, I am indebted to both of them for sitting with me having the patience you know because it is it requires a lot of patience to, <laughs> to teach these skills you know they're, they're slow they can be a bit frustrating and and you know so it's quality you know so I have some really fun memories and you know and feel it's thanks to them that they started me on this particular textile journey. So you started I guess by watching and then you started what, what did you do next do you remember did you start with knitting and so uh, yeah I'm trying I was sort of thinking yeah so I did um, knitting um, my sister did crochet uh, we also did a hand embroidery and patchwork and you know just some hand sewing but um yeah i do remember making little things um little embroideries and cushions and uh, how old were you do you think you were like nine uh yeah so probably like eight or something like that um maybe even younger but i think at age 10 i was sort of taking it you know right you know this is sort of my hobby <laughs> you know this is what i do in my spare time and yeah i started to kind of do it more consistently yeah as we as we're going to find out more about <laughs> do you remember the first item of clothing that you ever made 
And if so, could you describe it for us? Well, I don't remember the first item I made from scratch, but I do remember distinctly this pair of um, little skinny jeans that I'd been given age 10, which were ever so trendy. And I thought, you know, I was the business with these little skinny <laughs> jeans with little zips at the side. And oh, look at me and my trendy little jeans. And um, <laughs> so I wanted to keep these going as long as possible. So I did, this, you know, patch them and I made really nice like embroidery wow. patch patches to go on my little skinny jeans um, and I remember making you know like a rainbow <laughs> I, and doing it all hand embroidered and, and that went on to the jeans and then when I could no longer squeeze into these <laughs> jeans anymore <laughs> I, I turned them into a duffel bag Gosh, so, so I cool. was you know upcycling from a very young age you know uh, but I didn't know that it was called upcycling <laughs> like I was just using, as you do as a child, it's like, well, what have I got to hand, you know? And my obviously, I love these jeans and I wanted to use them. And I made a, like a drawstring duffel bag. So I, um, and I did, you know, I remember going to the town with my dad to buy some rope that I could use, you know, as a handle. So the handle went through the belt loops. Yes. And then, big, you know, that's how you could open and close the bag and then it had like a big knot that I somehow attached into you know I'd cut them off at the knees and um attached yeah the handle there and closed it off anyway so a real labor of love this project thank you so much for sharing you're a champion of upcycling which is a concept you beautifully describe on your website um can you tell us about the cradle to grave production model this is the cradle to cradle model okay so um Well, really, this model is highlighted in a book called Cradle to Cradle, um, which was published in the early 2000s. And I, you know, and I found this book really inspiring and interesting, um, really for the language, I guess. Again, we spoke of upcycling. So I had been practicing this method of reworking textiles, but I guess I would refer to it at that time as recycling, which, yes, it is a form of recycling. But this book, um, written by William McDonough, I'm just looking at it now so I get their names correct, William McDonough and Michael Braungart. So they are an architect and a chemist. So they looked at, you know, the this model of manufacturing that's really was rooted in the Industrial Revolution, where we've been on this very linear one-way path um, of manufacturing, of, you know, just taking resources, making things, you know, using more resources and polluting, um, and then wasting things, you know, throwing things away, when actually it hasn't really fulfilled its full lifespan. So the more circular model, and we're hearing this as more of a buzzword recently of, you know, regenerative um, food, fashion, etc. It's really inspired by nature, you know, it's the cycles, it's the cyclic, it's the surf going full circle where um, with the cradle to cradle, you know, obviously you create something that then at the end, of, you know, well, from the inception, actually, from the point of starting, especially with manufacturing, you know, you're thinking about your choices of materials, your resources to be as low impact as possible and then how you're making your product, what's going to happen to it at the end of life. And for that product to then, um, they describe technical nutrient in the book, which is where, you know, your product can be disassembled and then those parts can form something else. You know, it's a valuable resource, but it's made in such a way that it can be disassembled or it could be repaired, renewed in some way or a biological nutrient so that it can safely go back into the ecosystem, you know, to become food in some way for, you know, it will biodegrade and it won't pollute. Um, so those were this kind of concepts that they're looking at um, and using, obviously, the beautiful term of cradle to grave or cradle to cradle, because um, we can kind of band these phrases around and maybe, you know, take them for granted. But I, I found them quite powerful. Um, symbols, if you like, that we can think about um, all the time, you know, of how we how we do things. Because I guess in the first point, it, you know, it comes from within our kind of intention, really, and our thought processes, our attitudes. 
and then that will then inform you know our our actions and our, our way of being but i found like even from my parents to to me and then like the younger generation now it's it's amazing how quickly the consciousness of clothes uh because we're talking about textile has changed so much like it's uh i would wear stuff to death You know, I would wear shoes until I couldn't fit in. Like I, I would wear my sister's clothes and it's totally fine. You know, they were beautiful stuff. I was more than happy to wear them. But there was this idea like hand me down um, was, was a very normal. Oh, hand, oh, hand me up. Hand me up, yes. <laughs> it's a very common thing. And now it's like this greediness for just more stuff. So it's cheaply made, probably not ethically made, but um I think people just like, like younger people, like things to come and go. Uh, and sometimes, of course, it's dictated by less income. So you buy something that's cheaper because you can't afford more. I'm always quite, in a way, shocked how quickly we went from like reusing a lot, keeping, you know, buttons, trying to mend to, to just throwing stuff away if there's a hole in it, basically. <laughs> I mean, in my lifetime, really, I've, I've seen, seen this, you know, change um, and also return because I think at this time there is a movement that's returning to these old ways or new ways or, you know, timeless, I should say, ways because with fashion um, we have, you know, it's or pur purposeful it's almost like perceived obsolescence where actually you know and it, uh, when we look at the sort of history of making things we can see you know that manufacturing processes are just speeding up speeding up more 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 where we had once upon a time two seasons you know autumn winter spring summer in terms of fashion seasons rather than <laughs> natural cycles um I believe there's something like 52 micro seasons now within fashion, you know, of just pumping out more clothes, but it's persuading. There's also then you've got the underpinning of that, of the advertising that, you know, came in and sort of the persuasion really of um, of a need really to, to buy more. Um, because, yeah, I understand with poverty, but we're seeing people buying a lot of cheap clothes that I can't afford not to, I think, you know, so it is, but it's kind of a, where's this kind of behavior come from? You know, why do people feel the need to do that? You know, and I'm not judging in any kind of way, but there's lots of perceptions around, there has been historically around secondhand, you know, growing up, I didn't have that where I was in Wales, there wasn't really stigma to secondhand. But perhaps in the city, there was a different view to that, you know, if you were walking around in someone else's clothes. But now I see it's like the opposite, like, charity shops are looking like boutiques, you have bloggers and people, you know, talking about their secondhand looks that they're putting together. We have apps, you know, where people can sell on their secondhand clothes. And, you know, it's been, there's a culture building around it, you know, so people start to think of it as being quite cool and trendy and it's something they want to do. And I guess you call it vintage and then that sounds better. <laughs> Because there's something when I moved to the UK, like I had a, one of my flatmates was very much into like vintage stuff. And she, she took me around and I was like, but what, what is vintage? You know, I didn't hear the, the word before. I was fresh here in, the, in London. And she was like, you know, it's just like a, a clothes that have been made a little while ago. But I'm like, so you mean like they're secondhand? They're like, no, it's vintage. <laughs> so, but they are, you know, it's just like they're clothes that have been worn before and which find another life. But she's funny because she really, I think she also referred maybe to a specific era. For her, the word vintage referred to a specific era, you know, maybe 50s, 60s. And for me too, actually, you know, I would think of it, you know, pre-1960s really, or maybe 70s now that I'm yes. a bit older. But now, <laughs> nowadays, to the new generation, it's like things from the 90s are being categorized yes, as vintage. I see vintage. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I know, I'm just like, I feel so old sometimes. <laughs> 
I mean, but uh, you know, a, a lot of these things are um, probably not as much in circulation, are they? So, um, or if they are, they are commanding a high, you know, they higher value pieces, you know, those kind of original items. But the quality, obviously, of clothing has really diminished, you know. So when you look at what I would say is vintage, you know, pre nineteen seventies, there's a lot of consideration for the longevity of the garment within the making. You know, the, the seams can be much bigger, so you can let it out because body it's thinking about body shapes change in time so you can um, adjust things you know whereas the modern sort of fast fashion module is you know if there's a big seam that's like over thousands of garments is a huge cost so it's minimizing and um, I guess cutting corners where possible quantity over quality hey sadly moving on to the happiest subject <laughs> you regularly so you have that shop for fabrications on Warrior Market, and you regularly host workshops on various techniques and themes. Um, for instance, um, zero waste doing, where would be wasted materials are reused. Uh, you do cushion making and way, way more things than what I, I mentioned here. You also get on board experts in their field uh, for more specialist techniques. Um, I find as such as sorry, shibori, a Japanese dyeing technique, and sashiko, Japanese functional embroidery. So you really get very specific. Um, but so in this way, you have both a creative role, you have an educational role, and you act as a facilitator as well. Um, are you enjoying those various roles in equal measure? Interesting question. I mean, the, the um, going back to the sort of intro bit, the educational aspect of fabrications is really important to me, um, as well as being a maker, you know, and I, I produce things myself. Um, and having the shop, you know, where I'm selling. And although I'm very considered about what's sold and the things I make, I feel the education is very, very important because that's, you know, passing on the skills to others, encouraging others. And in my experience, I'm meeting a lot of people that do want to step away from ways of consuming and to be more resourceful, but they maybe haven't had the opportunity to learn these particular skills particularly around basic sewing repairs, you know, sewing on a button or lifting a hem or mending a hole, you know, things that, you know, my grandmother's generation, that was the norm. Most people in my household, my father knew how to do this. Um, and then in turn were taught me, me you know, uh, but I'm seeing, a, you know, that for different reasons, it has jumped a generation, um, but there is, and it's, and and not always taught in schools as well. You know, I think up, up there was a point, you know, when I grew up, we learned some textile skills and woodworking and metalwork and cooking in school. So there's also been a shift there. Um, but back to the, you know, the workshop program that I offer. So we have a kind of like general skills, you know, learning to use the sewing machine, hand sewing knitting crochet but then it's also fun to introduce people to other techniques and work with other makers who've got those areas of speciality you know where they've practiced these techniques themselves so i felt i wanted to you know collaborate with other makers and give them a space to share their skills as well um, and because there's quite a lot of strands already, then I can kind of rotate around. So, you know, it's important for me to also be in the shop to meet people and chat to people in the shop and to also have time in the studio um, developing my own making practice because that helps me also with the teaching because I'm keeping my hand in and, and I'm keeping on inventing and looking at ways of doing things that I can then share with others. Um, so in terms of the roles and um, yeah, I mean, I enjoy doing everything. <laughs> whatever, whatever I'm doing in the present moment, that's where the joy is. Um, so anything in the studio, you're, you're happy, anything more like admin and spreadsheets? So, I mean, if I'm honest, yes, that side is true. You know, that kind of the accounting, the, the you know, all that admin side is less joyful. But I, I recognize that I have to wear different hats <laughs> and you have to um, put yourself into that role 
and that is a role that you need to do. So there's a little bit of separation um, in a way that, you know, okay, this is what I'm doing now. I'm doing this role or this task, and this requires a certain mindset, um, a certain set of skills. Um, and I'm just going to kind of get on with it yes. as, as best I can. Get it done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it's interesting. I think, you know, for me, I, I've always enjoyed um, variety, um, diversity, you know, doing multi sort of tasks. I'm trying not to multitask. I'm trying to do more of doing things one at a time because, um, you know, if you try and do too many things and you spread yourself too thin. So it's always this kind of balancing, juggling act, isn't it? <laughs> As we navigate our way through um, daily life. Is there any um, specific reason to it that led you to open a shop in Hackney? Uh, so did you did you live in East London beforehand and you like the area? Or? Yeah, so I lived in East London. Um, really, I guess I must admit I'm an accidental shopkeeper. <laughs> no. We love those. <laughs> Um, I, I hadn't envisaged myself being a shopkeeper. I always knew I wanted, from a young age, I wanted to do something creative. I wanted to do my own thing. I always um, had this sense of independence, in a way, of um, doing my own thing. And um, But I didn't quite know what form that would take. And in the 90s, the late 90s, I visited the Hidden Art of Hackney, which was an open studios event. And at that time, a lot of the shops on Broadway Market were empty and the Hidden Art had managed to negotiate with the council to open up some of the shops for the open studio event. So makers, creatives could, you know, exhibit and, um, in the empty shops. So I came along for this event because I was living in um, Upper Clapton at the time mm -hmm. and just was like, wow, what is this place? you know, really special between the park and um, the canal. Um, also, just because the shops were quite deteriorated and you just felt this strong sense of history, but also strong community spirit of the area. And I then learned that um, the council was looking for people to take on the empty shops. So I... Um, was looking for a studio at the time and so I thought well why not you know I'll apply for one of these shops to um, be a studio space and you know it may be quite interesting to explore having a window onto the world um, so that's what I did uh, the first shop I applied for was uh, where La Bouche is now um, and I applied um, with two other businesses so one was um, Continental Drifts who um, do a lot of events all over London, UK. I mean, they're also based, um, they were based in Hackney. Now they're more over in Tottenham. So we were going to share, you know, this space, as, you know, as a bit of a collective, if you like, and, you know, do the work to do it up. But then that fell through. So I then learned of another shop. Um, and anyway, to cut a long story short, that empty shop would become fabrications just a bit further um, down <laughs> after, after lots of work <laughs> so it you know two and I negotiated two years rent free with the um, council because it needed so much work doing to get it you know open for the public so I did really take a leap of faith because it was just you I mean it was just you, you did, it was not you plus a business partner right um well there was another friend originally when we applied but then she um found a space in Hackney Week for um her work and so then it was just me and then there was one <laughs> it's so brave. It started off a started off a team and then it was just me thanks guys bye but, um, no no it's not okay. you know everyone for the right decision in a way you know because they found spaces probably that are better yes that are suited needs. yes um and i um I'm still fortunate to be in the same space um, after a lot of um, negotiating, building work, exchanges, you know, skill swaps, uh, really doing it on a shoestring. <laughs> Incredible, because at the same time, parallel to opening the shop, you were also working for studios. Yes, so I, I um, alongside this was working in the film industry, so I was saving up 
So I was doing, um, you know, it's quite intense, that sort of work. So you're working all the time from <laughs> dusk till dawn, it feels like. I can just imagine. Um, but I also enjoyed that type of work as well because you're working in a team, you're using your skills, you're learning new skills, um, developing, you know, you're not my sort of textile Costume, it was in costumes, we did a lot of historical costumes, so that's quite, you know, interesting and just seeing how how the film industry, you know, works, um, being on set, being behind the scenes, um, so did various projects and jobs like that. And then slowly I've sort of eased into, you know, working full time for myself. So, yeah, there was a sort of transition, you know, where I was part time um between my foot in both camps, so to speak, um, until then, you know, I could do it full time. You can be proud, you know, it's not a small, small leap of faith, you know, that you took. Um, so we're talking about the workshops that you offer earlier. Who do you see attend your workshops? And is your clientele very diverse in terms of age, um, ethnical, cultural background? Yes, very, very diverse. And because the time I've been there, you know, it's 23 years of being open I've also done a lot of outreach work in the community um, done different events again community events all over East London um, so I've had you know the opportunity to meet lots of different people and share with them what I do so um, yeah and I also I'm very active with trying to do things within my space to encourage people in um, to share what I have set up, you know, the, the space, the resources um, that are there, different initiatives. Uh, so, yeah, it, it is, um, I'm really happy that it is because for me, you know, that's a strong value of fabrications is the community, um, building community. Yes. And I think craft is a very natural way of building community um, amongst people that have very different backgrounds, beliefs, walks of life, you know, because you have that common interest and um, common bond as well that can form through making, through sharing that space together. You know, it's I always see it as having no boundaries, really, when you're in the craft space. Anything crafty, you just see, you just bond on the... Um and the mastery required, on the patience required, then you connect with human qualities because these are skills that which take us a long time to acquire and have the dexterity. It just says a lot about a person, I think. Um, so I can totally see how it transcends everything else. It's just you strip everything more superficial and you, you just come back to, to the core of the person. So sewing and knitting and all these wonderful crafty things um they're more than just a skill it's the creative process a way to live more sustainably um so you said you've been 23 years now at fabrications what general trends or shifts have you noticed so we mentioned a little bit earlier um and do you feel that people are more environment conscious and are they more interested to find out who who makes their clothes as well yeah i i mean it's hard for me to speak outside of in a way my bubble but certainly um locally and within london and uk is where i suppose i can base my observations i am seeing a big shift um of people wanting to you know learn these skills to be more resourceful um and also you know buying secondhand clothes and doing them up going to charity shop shopping um slowing this sort of process really of slowing down as well and um, living life more slowly more mindfully mm -hmm. I think the you know the COVID the lockdown I think also fostered this type of outlook as well because we almost had like a forced slowdown but from that I think a lot of you know um, positive things have emerged qualities um People have perhaps made major changes um, because they had that space to reflect on their lives, on themselves, um, on their family, on their community, on, on, and to, you know, change things for the good. Did you see more people coming to your workshops? 
Well, it's interesting. I think there's definitely during the lockdown, people did pick up a lot of crafts because, you know, we've, we've recognised that it's um, has great value for well-being. And so even if someone hasn't tried something before, you feel that when you have a go. I mean, once you've perhaps got through some frustrations or threads breaking <laughs> or <laughs> sticky bits, um, again, I think, you know, during the lockdown, there was space to explore and experiment. Um, and there's obviously a lot more resources online now that people, you know, can follow as well. So when things like the classes were closed, people could still access kind of expertise in a way. So certainly, yes, um, I'd say the interest has grown. But in terms of where I see with the classes, we've changed our model quite a lot. We're not taking as many people now, the groups are smaller, because we're still trying to keep the studio quite spacious for people. Because I think COVID really isn't over yet. And people are still being cautious, as I see it. So and we also have other factors now, you know, people are thinking about other costs, you know, got higher cost of living at this time. So where people are putting their time and money. So the classes, were, we've been sort of rebuilding, if you like, because, you know, when things open and close, you lose that momentum um, with, with anything, you know, that you're doing. So, but now I feel it's kind of the, um, I can feel with the amount of inquiries and people coming um, that it's coming back again for us. Um, but generally, just, you know, looking around what's happening, um, I think definitely there's a big, big shift. And, you know, I'm just seeing this huge, um, the buzzword at the moment is circular economy, regenerative, this, that, the other. Um you know, I feel in within the society, you know, and we've got COP27 at the moment, people and businesses are feeling the responsibility, you know, more and more and the urgency to make change and to be more careful and implement change within their systems. Let's hope that this trend of being more sustainable continues because the fashion industry is a big polluter. It's, it's huge, yeah. But I, what I see, um, and even I'm working on a very micro, individual, handcrafted level, I just do think, you know, that those small, because it's, you know, ultimately change can only come from within each person. We obviously have the bigger change of bigger systems that need to be dismantled and kind of rebuilt. But, you know, the seed starts with every person, you know, within. So I think as you change yourself, change happens around and then that creates a ripple effect within the family life, the community life, the society. <laughs> and so it keeps rippling out. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people underestimate that, but really every single action counts. In the introduction of the podcast, um, I mentioned the Remember Me project. Um, could you tell us about what it is and how you happen to have this truly wonderful idea? Oh, thank you, yeah, and thanks for the, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to um, speak about this service because it's very close to my heart. Uh, so through the Remember Me, people can bring their special clothes and textiles that hold sentimental value to me to be, um, you know, renewed, remade into something new so quite often it's um can be a lost loved one's items so the the person might not know what to do with these things but they don't want to throw them out um so they come to me with these items and we you know when the time is right obviously um that they because it's you know it can be quite raw um And, you know, obviously the idea of someone maybe cutting into, you know, can be just a bit too much for some people. Um, but when the time is right, when someone's ready and, you know, everything at its right time, um, I work with the person that's brought the items to um, create something new. And quite often the person is wanting to give gifts to other family members. So I create um, special cushions or quilts or, you know, even items of, you know, remake the clothes into something different. So the commissions are really personal and really varied. 
I feel a big part of this service is really um, also listening, giving someone space to talk. And I listen and, um, you know, I feel really privileged to be, to, you know, that people share their stories and, and their memories of a loved one and how um, these items of clothing obviously embody that person and the memories are triggered by handling the clothes, looking at the clothes of um, times shared. And so I, you know, part of the ideas come from just that deep listening to someone. And we then discuss ideas of, you know, what I'm going to make. Um, and I then involve the person in the process. So as I'm working and getting ideas, I'll share, you know, am I going in the good direction here? Um, communicate and take pictures. Um, some people just, you know, they trust me and they go, no, nope, just up to you, you know. <laughs> it's the items that the people, you know, have got maybe certain clear ideas of what they want, but they don't have the technical skills to realise the idea. So, yeah, it's a very um, beautiful personal service. Um, and then, you know, and it's surprising actually how therapeutic it can be for the person. So it's a really healing process as well. Um, Is this something that you did for you personally before offering the service to customers? No, I mean, it's interesting you should say that. I mean, I have made some items out of my father's clothes that he's given to me, but he's still alive. Uh, but my mum isn't. And so I think there is a part of me, you know, when I started this, uh, um, unconsciously, you know, I was sort of grieving. <laughs> and, you know, it was surprising to me because it came out uh, later in life, this sort of grief, this um, recognition of something I was experiencing that had been bubbling away under the surface that then was affecting how I was in a way, how I was conducting myself. Um, so I think part of me then has this um, empathy, you know, for how about, or maybe some personal understanding of grief. Maybe I can help just by being there listening And um, the transformative aspect as well of how we can sometimes take difficult experiences and turn them into something else, something of beauty, transformational qualities of some sort. I don't want to really prescribe what that might be because it's different for every person. It's such a magnificent project and in one form or another, it helps maintain connections uh, with the people we love, whether they're still around or are no longer with us, sadly. I'm going to go back to very practical matters. Um, you receive subsidies from Hackney Council for some of your workshops, uh, which allows you to offer concessions and free spaces. Um, what type of workshop get to benefit from, from the support of Hackney Council? Um, so sorry, I do need to correct you there because ah. I, I haven't um, actually received funding from Hackney Council. But maybe what you've picked up on is I've been collaborating a lot with Yodomo which, um, and they received a, um, a grant from Hackney Council, which enabled them to set up a, um, a new circular textiles-based circular hub at Hackney City Farm. And so alongside the hub, you know, so people can become a member of the Hackney Reuse um, Group and then access free resources, which Yodomo are collecting from businesses um, which otherwise would have gone to landfill or incinerated. And it's some very high quality items, you know, fabric offcuts, cap carpet offcuts, yarns um, that are perfectly good. You know, they're really good quality. Um, um, and so, you know, they're kind of then curating them in this space and you can come in and collect things and they weigh it. <laughs> so they're monitoring, you know, the, the amount of waste that's being diverted And then they're encouraging people to share what they make with them. So there, it could be someone um, who's running a small business. It could be just a keen crafter. It could be, you know, educational project. It might be something else. You know, there's no parameters in a way that it's just really encouraging reuse um, and a circular, again, economy, you know, thing, things circulating in the community. So alongside, there's been workshops anyway to teach skills 
um, of how you can use things, you know, resources in the hub, because they also identified that perhaps people are coming along and they might not know how to use some of the resources they would like to, but perhaps haven't got the skills. So um, that's where the um, free and subsidised Hackney Council workshops have been coming in. But I personally um, decided, you know, with the cost of living crisis, that I too would start offering some um, free sewing classes. So for my beginners sewing at fabrications for people that who could otherwise not afford to come because I still, you know, wanted to encourage people. So we're building up like, you know, people can come in and have a chat to me and say, you know, why they want to learn to sew a little bit about their situation. It's not like filling out forms or and you know, it's in a more informal basis. And then I um, have got a list. So then if there's a space available on a class, I can then contact someone last minute and say, oh, you know, would you like to come along to this class? So I've been offering that. It's a gesture of goodwill for the community. So people, people specific, you know, around the um, London Fields, Hackney area, area that I'm offering that to. That is brilliant. And so for getting my information a bit incorrectly and <laughs> thank you for correcting me <laughs> um where is your heart at the moment that so you are going to start these courses or classes for beginners what what project is is there in the pipeline ready to bring out <laughs> well i'd say you know my heart is here <laughs> with you at this present moment that's all i can say really because i'm just really trying to be as present as possible yes there are um things in the pipeline but um, my heart is here that's fine i will share these your information anywhere in the caption so people can find out all about them <laughs> people want to know more about you know it's constantly changing in the shop because i make these one-off pieces upcycled pieces so at the moment um you know it's the autumn time so i have some really nice zero waste sweatshirts that i've made um, and then there's supplies there if people are doing, you know, their own crafty projects. And then the classes, you know, if people are interested in classes on the website, there is a calendar. You can see what's coming up. Is this an opportunity to share um, events that are coming up? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm participating in the E8 Art and Craft Trail that's going to be taking place on the weekend of the 3rd and 4th of December. So this is like an open studios event. So I think there's now 16 makers, artists participating. So it's like a walking tour, you know, a very localised, you know, so obviously this is London Fields, Broadway Market, down to Ridley Road. Uh, people, you can go and visit people's studios on this weekend. So it's sort of quite, you can be nosy, <laughs> look around. Who doesn't want to do people's that? People's studios. <laughs> um and people, you know, my plan is, you know, because I'm obviously open studio all year round. Maybe I'll be closed studio that weekend. <laughs> That'd be different, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm pulling out some archive pieces that um, I'm going to show. Um, and I'm also making some new items at the moment that I'll have on display that weekend. Also, in December, on Sunday the 11th, I'm doing a demonstration at Yodomo Circular Hub at Hackney City Farm that's all around uh, DIY, you know, green Christmas wrappings and decorations. So I'm going to be, um, they have some very beautiful silk offcuts. So I'm putting together some kits with this silk fabric and fabrics to make rosettes and bows so people can come along and learn how to wrap so i'm using the japanese method of furoshiki which is wrapping a an object in a square of fabric so showing different methods and also how to make your own bows and rosettes and you'll get a kit as part of it so that's sunday the 11th um a booking needed for that link in the caption um Bali, thank you so so thank much you. for your time. So I've thank taken you an hour as of your well. time. Has it really <laughs> an hour? Oh my goodness. Yes. God, that's just um that was just such a lovely conversation with you and, and thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast. To find out more about Bali and what is happening at Fabrications, 
please head to www.fabrications1.co.uk where you'll find a calendar tab to keep up to date as to what Bali is organizing. And you also find her, of course, on Instagram and the handle is Fabrications Hackney. I'm also putting in the captions, so please read the captions. Um, I'll put a link to the E8 Arts and Crafts Trail happening on the 3rd and 4th of December, so Saturday, Sunday, 3rd and 4th of December, as well as a link to book to potentially the demonstration at Yodomo, uh, Christmas wrapping and decorations made with um, silk fabrics, according to this Japanese method uh, Bali was talking about. Bye for now, have a good day and thank you for listening.